I did not I have the you... Nuggets winning the Western Conference Finals. I actually had the Thunder, <laughs> who we oh, can get wow. into you now. Are, you are a truther. Thunder versus Mavs. Let's let's do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I've just been increasingly excited about this Thunder team all year round. And I think uh, despite how awesome... Um, I guess despite like the incredibly high level of perimeter defense we're seeing from the Timberwolves right now, um, from the Celtics and Eastern Conference, um, the team that I actually think is really sneaky, incredible, uh, defending the perimeter and just figuring out a way to make things really tough on your primary ball handler is actually the OKC Thunder. I've just been like blown away. Um, Lou Dort has kind of like reached a new level of. Uh, I guess defensive greatness like you know Brandon Ingram was coming off of an injury and I understand he wasn't 100 percent but in the first round like Lou Dort made Brandon Ingram look like he didn't even belong in the NBA basically um I think it's actually more a matter of like Lou Dort is now back in the playoffs and we kind of yeah, forgot that every time Lou Dort's been in the playoffs he has absolutely like you know jaw-droppingly eyes wideningly um done some damage to like he went up against like MVP level james harden and we're like james harden can't get a step on him on some yeah. of these possessions like they were scrapping their offense to like figure out figure out systems of screening for james harden just to get him away from lou dort and lou dort is just like i don't i don't see these screen i didn't like like i feel like you like ask lou dort like oh how are they screening in the game he's like i have no idea that they were trying to screen me i just don't even notice them <laughs> like yeah he's like his ability because i don't even think of him as like but the quickest footest guy in the NBA. Like, I think that there's, there's quicker play. I mean, he looks so heavy. Maybe it's sort of like deceptive, like, um, but he slides around these screens. Usually big bodied guys like that have like a hard time. You think more like someone like Tony Allen, like slithery guys getting around screens, but Lou Dort is just like getting the right angle. He sees a screen. He just gets that nice angle. He just tucks right around it like that. It's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And yeah, he's got, now five straight games of just completely humiliating the other team's best player. Yeah. But then the Brandon other thing is, like, OKC has found that second guy. Like, they have those two elite perimeter defenders with uh, Jalen Williams' ascension this year. Um, yeah. And cause... He, he doesn't get talked about enough in terms of the stuff he does on defense. It's not as loud as Lou Dort in terms yeah. of, like, the on-ball stuff, but, like... Well, it's not, but, I like, mean... Jalen Williams' advanced stats are, like, eye-popping. Like, he's performing at the level of, like, an all-star player, even though he doesn't have, you know... Maybe the offensive numbers to back that up, but I think the main reason why that is is his two-way play has been incredible. Um, you know, he has yeah. really long arms. I think he has what, like a seven-foot-one or seven-foot-two wingspan. Seven-two. Seven yeah, he's just like strong as an ox. Like you cannot move him. Um, and then, like again, he's just a really good athlete, especially especially laterally, vertically. You know, he's he's maybe OKC's best uh, rim protector after Chet. Um, yeah. You know, like the two of them do a. Like, OKC doesn't have a stout center. I mean, they don't have a seven foot two, two 272 pound behemoth who can just, like, swallow up rebounds. And that's everyone's first criticism of, of the Thunder this year. But, like, they actually do a really good job defending the rim um, because they have two guys and Williams and Chet um, who are really long and have, you know, like, excellent reach and excellent timing. Um, and so they, they defend the basket pretty admirably just despite their lack of... Uh, I don't know the the guy who you'd kind of think of the prototype in that role. I mean, I think it's so funny, like because people still won't really shut up about the Thunder's size, as though it's like this weakness. But like, can you show me like one game this season where it bothered them? Like, can you show me any stretch where the Thunder like, oh, we we definitely need to add some more size, like. Yes, like, yeah, they're not a strong rebounding team. Like, there are obvious drawbacks to what they yeah. do, but that's always been baked into the plan. And there's just never been any evidence that their size is that their lack of size is something that teams have been able to consistently punish them with enough to like yeah. win games against. I mean, this they're is the number one seed in the West. Their biggest thing has just been they do get out rebounded by teams that play like a really big traditional center. I mean, the most famous one was you know, like Yusuf Nurkic's career high 31 rebounds. You know, but the the Suns lost that game, and I think like a large part of it, and something that people don't take into account enough is, um, like if you have a use of Nurkic, or if you have another just big center on the floor, um, I mean, yes, you are going to get more rebounds, you are going to get more possessions, but your offense is inherently going to be less efficient than the Thunder's because you have um, the center on the floor, um, you know, and and the 
the Thunder are going to take advantage of that defensively. They're going to attack the guy. They're going to find a way to get him moving in space, and then that's going to open up lanes to the rim. And then on the other side of the floor, like, you know, Jonas Valanciunas did have a couple of games where he kind of bullied Chet a little bit in the first half, and he scored a bunch in the post. Like, I think he had one game where he had, like, 18 or 20 in the first half. But, you know, like, even that level of offense, um, I mean, it's consistent, but it's not, like, it's not super explosive. Like, so I don't think the Thunder are that worried about you getting a bunch of post touches and then finishing those at a high rate. Um especially if it's like your third or fourth best player who's doing that. Like that's just not the kind of offense that's just concerning enough where you're going to, you have to like overreact and and put someone in the game um, to try to deal with Valanciunas. Well, I mean, Jonas Valanciunas is also like, you know, somewhat of an outlier in the NBA and his ability. Yeah. There's not a lot of guys like that. And like, like, but you're, but you're right. And I, and I love you on his felon tunis, but like how many times have we seen him like completely dominate a one-on-one matchup over a quarter. And then like his team never passes him the ball again. <laughs> um, but yeah. also, yeah, I do think that like, I do think that Jonas Valanciunas post offense, it just only goes so far. He doesn't, um, he doesn't really have long stretches where he's like shooting 80, 90% on his post look like he's a really efficient post player but it maxes out at like yeah i'm gonna hit like 50 to 60 percent of these two point looks if i'm like it's it's he's at his best when you're giving him opportunistic post looks up and mixing in his offensive rebounding like he is he is someone that boosts offensive efficiency but if you're gonna play everything through him your offense shrinks down to something kind of small and specific really quickly yeah um, with no no bells and whistles. So, I mean, the Thunder, like their, their offense is just like, they're like death by a thousand cuts. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like they just like, they can, they've got like Shea, Gal, Shea, Shea Gilgis Alexander, who is able to get in the teeth of your defense whenever he wants and get a good look. But if you sell out to send extra stuff at Shea, like, like they just immediately turn that drive into a kick into a second drive into a kick into a third drive and have multiple like it's just like it just feels like you're literally getting like you keep thinking you're making these like you know big blo- like if it's like a sword fight it's like oh i made this big block like why am i like bleeding from three spots yeah. like where did where did those cuts come from like that's what it feels like to defend well you you can Thunder. tell you can tell the way sam presti has built this team he really values having multiple ball handlers on the floor at all times i mean the thunder pretty much have a they have three or four guys that can that are very comfortable attacking the rim against a closeout on the floor at all yeah. times. I mean, five even because Check can do that too. So Check can do that too. Jalen Williams can and will dunk on you. <laughs> like, yeah, like he had a couple of baseline drives, and I was like, oh my god. It's funny you don't like think of him as like, like he's not like the prototypical explosive athletes athlete, but like he's strong and he's fast enough, and if he just gets a little bit of downhill, like. Like yeah, he just he can turn a finish into a dunk, if you like you know like a, a surprising amount of time things that aren't usually dunks for guys like the defender's still on him. Yeah. Usually people are figuring out how to contest around that, and he's like, I will throw down a dunk on this possession. So he's like, yeah, he's a he's such a strange and interesting player. And I think like the funny thing about the Thunder is like everyone's like, well, how are like like they didn't want to like they know they're the number one seed, but they didn't really want to picture them making it to the finals or anything like that. It's just like, Mm -hmm. we're going to look back on this even next year when Jalen Williams and, and Chet Holmgren are on like an all NBA team being like, Oh, well this team is stacked. This team is always like, just like, yeah, but no one acknowledged they were stacked in the year 2024 because they were so young and we weren't ready to think of that. Like I just, I had Jalen Williams and Chet not on my like all NBA teams, but like in that next group of players where it's like uh, some of the guys on the, on the, you know, third and third all NBA were around the same level as these guys. So they're already like top 20, like level impact players, even if they're not in everyone's top 20. Yeah. And then Shea's the top two. <laughs> we should give the Thunder's opponent a little respect here. <laughs> they, are, they, again? they are playing the Mavericks. Uh, the Thunder are up one nil in the series. Uh, they mm-hmm. won the first game by 25 points. Um, they kind of had, Things, things started to to go well for the uh, Thunder to close the first half, um, and then I think they, they just really blew things open like later in the third quarter. Um, Luka is still really struggling to shoot from three. Um, he appears... I, I've, heard, I've heard that he's dealing with like an ankle or 
lower leg injury of some kind, so he's laboring a little bit out there. Um, and then speaking of the Thunder's weakness, you know, rebounding, like the Mavs are the worst offensive rebounding team in the NBA. So, I mean, this is not this is not a great matchup for the Mavericks because they can't even exploit like the one thing that you that you can kind of take advantage of. Uh, against My the concern for the Mavericks going up into the, into this series was, um, I thought the switchability of the bigs would be really tested because I, I do think of like um, I do think of Lively and Gafford as. Um, as switchable to an extent. Like I think like both of them are capable of playing in switching coverages, but there's a difference between being switchable and being like, this team is going to force you to switch on to Shea a lot um, yeah. or switch on to Jalen Williams. A lot. Like you're, you're, you're not going to, it's not like, Oh, you'll be sort of like hedging screen and rolls and switching and recovering. Like you're going to get trapped on an Island a lot against them. Um, and I thought that like, I thought they all had moments, you know, I, I do think like, Maxi Kleber being out is a sneaky um, bad loss for them. Just because I think he's just like a little bit more versatile of, of a big who also opens up an aspect of their offense. So like them not having that look, not that you want to feel like reliant on, on Maxi Kleber, but it just, it's a shame that they don't have that look in this series. Um, and I don't think that Gafford or Lively are the bigs that are going to like, you know, punish Chet, no. or, you know, like, or punish like Jalen Williams. Like, it's like, like the thunder don't have to worry about guarding anyone in the post because like, you're not like Lively's not going to like get a duck in and get a, and get a pass. It's like, it's lobs or nothing for those players. So yeah. I think that actually does play into, into OKC's uh, favor a little bit more. Um, I do think that you're not going to like, Luca's not going to, like, this is the worst playoff game Luca's ever had. This in game one, I think. Like, I'd have it's, to look over all the game logs. I'm there, pretty sure. Yeah. Like, he hasn't had a lot of bad playoff games, so I would believe. I it. mean, he had some rough games against the Clippers in the in the first round. Like, he yeah, it, it this, wasn't like it year. wasn't quite. Most yeah. of his bad playoff games have been this year because he's been hurt. Yeah, and he had like a game I think against the Warriors where they were like taking advantage of him sort of like defensively, and then there was like a a nice adjustment. Like they're like, but this is I don't remember him being like you know held to these shooting numbers and just looking like he couldn't get anything like like Luka Doncic scoring 19 points in a playoff game just does not seem like something that I had on my bingo card no. but um you know credit credit to OKC for that but I do think that obviously the Mavericks can play better I'm not a big like Jason Kidd truster the like even like sometimes in that Clippers recently series, extended Jason Kidd yeah so i always wonder with things when that happens because that's not like he's not the first coach that i've seen extended that we've seen extended mid playoff run is there like an is that like an under the table agreement where like it's already been discussed like if you get us through this playoff series you get your extension because like little, otherwise it was a little suspicious to me because the lakers rumors um but like it's either highly reactionary because it's in response to the lakers Inter wanting to interview him or are people speculating that they do but i mean I, I would hope that the mavericks don't operate their organization that way um you know <laughs> if you have out of, a, out of if fear have a, for losing like the 25th best coach in the nba yeah like if, if you have a even somewhat competent front office like you would assume that there would be more foresight into this extension than that or just like, I mean, what happens if you sign an extension? Like, it just, it, I don't, the optics are just that it's like a feel good signing. Who knows what the internal process was like? I'm not like, I'm not so emboldened in my ability to perceive the situation in its entirety from a fan perspective. But, um, yeah. And also, I, like, it, it will just, if you get swept right after, like, right after signing, um, a huge extension like that. And just, I think, like, he's got his warts as a coach. And the way the Mavericks beat the Clippers, like, I, I'm sorry. I just have to give the players a lot more credit than the coaching. You know, um, mm -hmm. James Harden struggled later in the series because Kyrie did an excellent job defending him. You know, yeah, the Clippers' was... offense wore down in large part because their role guys started missing a bunch of threes. Like, I didn't see the Mavericks adjust in such a way that they were like shutting down what the Clippers wanted to do. Um, as much as I just saw a team that you know, uh, was lacking Kawhi Leonard and, um, their, 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 their plan of attack was, uh, was, you know, fire it off from three, a whole bunch and, and it worked a couple of games and then it stopped working. 
Yeah, I do like the Kyrie Irving shout out because like he is the kind of guy that in the past he has shown the occasional possession of really strong man to man defense mm-hmm. um, and then sort of uh, not the highest level effort always on that end. But he's like he's always, you know, bo- like bottomed out as still being better than any of the defensive liability point guards. Like he's always been better than Trey Young, Dame Lillard. Yeah. Um, I've always thought he was like the tiniest bit underrated, even when I didn't think he was good on defense. So it is nice to see him lock in for a whole series. And I don't know if it was like every game, but he had like a couple games where the defense was loud, like really, really noticeable. Um, just like um, Clippers needed their guards to get going. They needed a lot out of James Harden and, and, you know, Russ to some extent. And like a Kyrie Irving proved to be a um, insurmountable obstacle to that at several decisive yeah. moments. So, and well, he played amazing on offense the entire time as oh, well. Yeah. Just like really, really like he's just become such a dependable seem like I like back when teams would try to make him the, the, the point of the, the focal point of the offense, Kyrie would sometimes be a little bit like, disappointing it was hard to build like a defense around what Kyrie Irving does but now it's like the narrative's almost like flipped in a sense where it's like I can kind of see like Kyrie's the sort of like guard you could just throw in on any team he's gonna just be able to generate really high level like shooting and scoring for you mm-hmm. without taking too much else off the table I, That's I how think he looks he's, in the abs right now. I think he's become and this is weird because this is not at all what he was doing when he was on the nets but on the Mavericks he's become like a really excellent off-ball player um and oh, maybe yeah, it was sure. because of his performance in the Nets, but I just remember when, when he was first traded in the Mavericks, a lot of people were like, you know, oh, there's only one ball, you know. Um, how are Kyrie and Luka going to coexist? But, like, Kyrie plays really well off of Luka now. Um, you know, like, you see him yeah. cutting the rim. Their two-man game in transition is, like, I don't think I've ever seen it not result in a bucket or a foul. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just two of the most genius players with the ball in their hands, like, especially from a scoring perspective. You know, Luca adds the dimension of passing that, that Kyrie does, but Kyrie's shooting 47% from three so far in the playoffs. Yeah. Like, um, so definitely a guy that um, deserves his flowers big time. Um, yeah, we need, to give, we need to give someone on the Mavs some love before we pick the Thunder to win in five, so. <laughs> well, I mean, OKC won game one at home. Yeah. Honestly, not really a big deal. Um, I think it's too early to... I'm really not a fan of the whole, like, I, I, I refuse to be the kind of fan who only believes the most recent thing that mm-hmm. that they saw. Like, um, yeah, OKC looked great in game one. Uh, Dallas looked like they had some problems. Let's see what game two is. I Even if OKC wins game two, like, let's see how they look back at home. Like, it's not a series until a team um, uh, loses at home. So I'm going to wait for that to happen before I feel... Too many ways. I do. I did like the OKC Thunder going into this series. Um, I picked the Mavs to beat the Clippers, um, but I had the Thunder beating the Mavs, and I'm not gonna deviate from that. I Thunder. I've got Thunder in in six. Um, yeah, I mean, with the Luca injury and with um, Maxi Kleba out, I feel really good about the Thunder. I mean, I I felt good about the Thunder going in the playoffs, going in the series, but, you know, especially now, um, I don't know if it's going to be a particularly long series. I guess, like, the one thing the Mavs can try is, um, and I don't remember if they tried this in game one at all, is uh, PJ at the five um, and just trying to go really small. I just feel like the Thunder do that, do it better than the Mavs would. Yeah, I just feel like you're, you're giving, I don't know what advantage you really gain by that. Also, is it just like... me or is PJ, like, really skinny now? Yeah, I mean, I remember him having yeah. like a bit more bulk when he was on the Hornets, or maybe I'm just and he was playing small ball five. Yeah, maybe Hornets I'm just stuff. misremembering that. No, I, I mean, I, I always think I've always thought of him as having like some good like power forward level girth, and you're right, he does look he does look he looks really, like a really three really now, right now, just like his body type. Yeah, so. he's like um, uh, prime Cleveland Kevin Love body <laughs> transformation. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple other things I, I do think like you know I think what the Mavericks need to focus on is like if again if luca's healthy enough to do it is like finding a way to get like who does luca want to attack on on okc like who like what is the matchup just the small guys i mean isaiah joe obviously when he's in the game is like the one guy on the thunder that you can consistently attack um other than that like he can just try bullying sga i guess um sga is just not strong enough for him even though sga is 
an admiral def- defender in his own right. He just doesn't have the strength to match up with Luca. So I yeah. guess I guess you go after SGA. Definitely not Jalen Williams. Um, Dort maybe. I mean Dort Dort is is he's a cinder block, but Luca's a bigger <laughs> cinder block. So yeah, I just don't think that Luca gets his um gets to the spots the way he likes as well. He can shoot over Dort for sure. Yeah, but as a ball handler, like. You know, when you think about like as a post player, if you got the height of it, like when you think of a Kristaps Porzingis post up, if they can get him in a position off the ball and get him the ball, and then he can just shoot over, that's a nice post up. Um, if you need to get, if uh, you need Kristaps Porzingis to have the ball and established position with the ball, that's a mess, right? Because like, and the thing about Luca on Dort is like he's got to get to his spot, and that's what Dort's going to stop him to do. Mm-hmm. It's not like Luca's going to go off the ball and they're going to throw an entry pass. Like I've just, you almost never see that in the Mavs offense. But I agree with like hunting Shea. I think that's like you got to go back at him because Shea was hunting Luca. Shea had a Shea was not shy about attacking him off the dribble, getting yeah. him in the post. He had like a. He had a couple of nice like uh, baseline fadeaways over Luca in the post. Like uh, you got to find a way to sort of like give it back. But it does feel the that the Thunder had surprisingly few weak spots. The other thing that people won't sh- wouldn't shut up about is like, what about Josh Giddy? What if they attack Josh Giddy? Like the Thunder have never had any problem just taking Josh Giddy off the floor. And you know what? Sometimes they leave him on the floor and he hits a crazy ton of corner threes and there's no like, and your strategy of like, a lim- like you know, leaving Josh Giddy open the corner hurts you. And if he's not hitting his corner threes, they just take him out and they bring in Aaron Wiggins or Isaiah Joe, or they have like, they've got tons of players that they're willing to like play 30 minutes in a game if you make it. So it's like uh, Josh Giddy's performance is like i feel kind of irrelevant like it's a bonus if if it happens yeah i mean josh giddy in these playoffs is shooting 45 percent from three and he's taking four a game so i'm not seeing huge liability um and well, the, 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 yeah the clippers the clippers were like we're we're gonna get you or sorry uh the, the, who, did the, who did the thunder play the pelicans were like we're gonna punish you for josh giddy and josh giddy was like I'm okay. really if you're gonna like leave me wide open in the corner, like yeah. looks like like I'm if that's one shot that I'm kinda comfortable with. Yeah, I mean he didn't have it's always hard because Josh Getty shot a career high from three uh this season on like double his um you know, previous volume. So like he was obviously a very very improved shooter during the season. But like it's always hard to know, like, is this hey is it is this like an Isaac Okoro situation where Isaac Okoro is, you know, okay from three in the regular season and just disappears in the playoffs? So far, it's appeared not to be. Josh Giddy has been better, uh, even than his regular season performance in the playoffs thus far. But like teams are still going to try it, especially when there's like so you have so few options for like how to just get one more one more available defender to like make rotations or or bring weak weak side help. Um, you know, it feels really obvious to me. Like I, I was I was watching it during the season is that Mark Digno and his coaching staff and Josh Giddy were like, look, this is what they're, this is what they're going to be doing in the playoffs. So mm. you are like, you're going to jack threes from the corner. Like yeah. you, you need to make this your most confident shot because like, yes, his, um, his percentage went up a bit in the regular season, but the bigger thing is that he just took about like two to three times as many of his threes from the corners. Like, you know, like, like it was like almost 40% of his threes were corner threes where in the past it's been like, you know, le- like less than 20%. So that's, um, that's just the big change there. It's like, there's like, you're comfortable taking this shot, get really comfortable taking that shot because that is like a counter that has to be built into our offense. That being said, you know, he barely, he, he didn't really play much in the Dallas game and he was completely ineffective when he was out there and, and he missed his, he missed his, uh, only two three point attempts finished the game with two points on one for four shooting with uh two assists um and wasn't really a big factor in the game so we'll see if that's just like whether he's going to be a feature of this series but again i just don't think it matters i think the thunder have the depth where it's like like we wouldn't like if it was like the mavericks like you know would we really be saying something just like well what if they like you know stopped guarding josh green it's like yeah josh green isn't a significant part of their rotation anyway so yeah yeah i mean he played more than josh giddy last game but (laughs) yeah well, I mean, Josh Giddy is really, really good at attacking closeouts. So, I mean, that's kind of the benefit with him is if you do sag off of him and then you kick the ball out to the corner and he, like, starts to shoot and then you panic and run out of him, he's going to blow past you. 
and then when I the defense really collapses, he's going to find a wide open shooter. So, yeah, he's the thing is like it's one thing to leave a player open; it's another thing to leave a player open but need a closeout. And you, so if he's good enough three point shooter from the corners, you need a closeout, and he's a he's a closeout killer. So, I just don't. It's, it's not really an advan- an advantage like that I yeah. see as being like super obvious. Other thing I want to shout out is Derek Jones Jr. in these mm-hmm. playoffs, but even he didn't like put up big numbers in game one or anything like that. But like he's just looking really like really confident and just like a really mean versatile defender he had he had some like i don't like he, he got he had a couple monster blocks in that game where just like he's always kind of invisible for a second and then like the arms come out and i'm just like who is that who is that like seven foot four guy on the floor and it's like oh it's uh the, like six foot six Derek jones jr but yeah um uh he's he's key for them like i think he's i think he's just basically become their best like perimeter defender like he's and i feel like he's kind of oh, graduated yeah. out of like I feel like Derek Jones Jr. has has arrived. He has found a role in the NBA, and he will be in demand for the next couple of years. So, uh, shout out DJJ. Let's go East. Wait, I haven't made my pick. Oh, yo, sorry. sorry, I, sorry. I will. I will actually go Thunder in five. Um, I yeah. wasn't joking. <laughs> I'm gonna you, do you, it. You, yeah, I, I took your joke really seriously. So I was. I was. <laughs> I, I was. Locked I believe a lot in this team. I mean, um, I have them going to the finals. I didn't. I technically didn't uh, really. Yeah, I haven't really committed to anyone like winning the finals yet, um, and we'll get into why that is when we talk about Celtics. But um, yeah, I mean, I think this. I I legitimately think this is one of the best three teams in the NBA. Um, I think they're having a huge coming out party right now. I I just think they're a lot better than Mavericks. So I don't know. I yeah. just I think they show it. I think they they take this series relatively easily. <laughs> 